you're serious about your goals, and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science, tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Folks, welcome back. Weekly webinar, Dr. Mike, Dr. James, here to answer your questions as always. Dr. Mike, how are we doing? You know, Yeah, I feel, I feel circling the drain, James. Mm -hmm. But on a serious note, I'm doing fine. I just got off a log flight from California where we were shooting all kinds of crazy videos, and uh, you and I got a chance to hang out a little bit. Yeah, never enough. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, well, let's get to it. We got a whole bunch of questions. Jump right in. Theano P. Not to be confused with Thanos. That's what I was thinking, like Thanos. Yeah, P. yeah your name could have been Thanos. What you playing? He says, Mike and James, I recently joined RP Plus and been loving the content. I started by watching lectures about hypertrophy, but quickly realized it's out of my depth and that I need prior knowledge. Could you please write me the content that I need to cover before I go to the lectures? Yes, all of the older videos that are all of the basic courses. Mm -hmm. They're literally on RP Plus. So like uh, we have uh, exercise physiology course, by Dr. Jason Miller is very long and very intense. And once you get through it, you'll understand that hypertrophy stuff pretty well. Yeah. And there's a bunch of other basics level kind of courses on there. Yeah. So just poke around for a little bit and they might even be organized by like beginner in advance, or at least they were for a while. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, they're definitely organized by date. So they're, they're just look for the uh, exercise physiology by Jason Miller. General question number one. Uh, also by Theano T says, I have read that you could potentially put on muscle um, mass while in maintenance calories, but that depends on your body fat percent. Mm -hmm. Is it backed up by publications or is it nonsense? Um, no, it's backed up by publications. <laughs> the thing is, is that um, there are sort of like better ways and uh, worse ways to do things. There are ways to stack the deck in your favor and stack against because a uh, concomitant uh, sort of analogical question would be like, you know, I've heard that, you know, with a fraction of the testosterone of males, females can still put on muscle. Be like, Yeah. Like, so what do I need my test for? To put it on faster, goddammit. So yeah, you can put it on the maintenance, but there's a big hard limit to that at some point because you can't, once you get down to the single digits in body fat, you're probably not replacing fat and putting in muscle. First of all, there's part of your answer. And the second part is even if you're at a lower high body fat percent, uh, maintenance is not the best way to gain muscle because the hypercaloric conditions offer a bunch of stuff uh, in, in uh, support of muscle gain. And if you want a ton of insight into that, we have a huge explanation of that. Renaissance Diet 2.0 book where we talk about literally like why a hypercaloric condition, what does it do for muscle gain? And there's like, Jesus Christ, there's probably like 10 sub points. Yeah. That's really not a product of just having a low body fat. So like the idea that you could just be at a low body fat and then just do maintenance and then just gain muscle would defeat the whole purpose of needing to do any sort of massing and cutting cycles, which yeah. we've already kind of determined is necessary. Um, that's more of a product of your training age than anything else. Right. So like if you were putting on substantial amount of muscle mass at maintenance calories. That's really just a product of you being more of a newbie to either dieting and or training. That's really the issue. So when we say maintenance, it literally means maintenance is in no change, right? It is maintaining what is or already has happened. So it does happen to a small degree, but not to a robust degree. And it's not something that you should plan and program for. That's the idea. Yeah. General question two, barbell hip thrusts seem to be considered a staple for glute hypertrophy. Does this movement deserve the hype in your opinion? Thanks in advance, Theano. So that's actually a really timely question because that one study just came out showing that the overall hypertrophic stimulus from uh, deep squats was uh, actually higher as far as net muscle growth than with uh, an equivalent number of sets of hip thrusts. Um, and I, that study is just one study, so I wouldn't take it too far, but that does align with the experience of myself and many other coaches, including Jared Feather, who has a bit of a... I, I do find that to be a little suspicious, though. It makes me wonder, too, like a couple other factors that could have contributed to that. <laughs> totally. So, so I will, what I will say is this. Here's my hypothesis, and I, I think it's probably correct, um, you know, which goes to say that other hypotheses I have, I have no idea if they're correct or maybe 60-40. I think this one's 80-20 guess that I'm making. We'll see if James agrees with me. I think that uh, very deep sumo squats and deep sumo deficit deadlifts um, and barbell walking lunges 
have a higher uh, raw stimulus magnitude, the ability to cause glute hypertrophy than uh, set per set than barbell hip thrusts or any other kind of hip thrust. But the stimulus to fatigue ratio is probably worse. So like barbell hip thrusts and other kind of hip thrusts probably don't grow much muscle in the glutes, uh, set for set, but you can do a fuckload of sets of them, especially per week. Um, like per workout, you can only do so many sets of anything. But Brett Contreras, who is the glute master, writes these programs. So it's like four, five, six glute workouts per week, and everyone's still alive and growing great glutes. And his workouts rely a ton on various different kinds of hip thrusting, including barbell hip thrusting. So I think that if your goal is to grow overall the biggest glutes possible, you're going to be eating a steady diet of barbell hip thrusts, so to speak, or hip thrusts in general, but you can absolutely supplement them with squats and lunges and um, – uh, deficit deadlifts. If you're going for, you're showing up to the gym and your goal is overall body hypertrophy. You don't have a lot of time, maybe not a ton of sessions a week. Your goal is to get big legs and big glutes. I would use barbell hip thrust judiciously, maybe not at all, because with lunges and deep squats and deadlifts, you can get a whole bunch of the rest of the leg and even the back um, and not have to piss away a ton of time on an exercise that has a high stimulus to fatigue ratio, SFR, barbell hip thrusts, but a very poor STR, stimulus to time ratio. So, and, and not so great raw stimulus magnitude, which sort of undercuts all of those. That's my, uh, my opinion on that. Uh, James, what do you think? Man? I think that's pretty spot on. The thing with the, the glute hip thrust is it, uh, and anybody who's done this can attest that uh, to really get it where you want to feel it, you have to play around with the technique quite a bit. It's not like with squats and stuff like, yes, there's lots of technique involved in the squat, but for the most part, if you go all the way up and go all the way down, you're hitting most of the muscle mass that you want to hit without really having to think too much about it. Where as the glute the, the hip thrust, you really got to kind of finagle your foot position, yeah. the, the, the bar position, whether you're pushing on the flat part of your foot or your heel, you know, it's like, it's a lot of finagling. So I think it's a good glute movement. It doesn't have quite as much systemic spillover as something like a squat or a deadlift. The thing is like the squats, the deadlifts, the lunges, they're just easier for people to get right like 90% of the time. Thus, getting back to what Mike was saying, like they have a really high raw stimulus magnitude. Most people can do it and not fuck it up, right? And so you're just going to get a lot out of those movements. So I think using those movements in combination with some kind of like glute bridging every now and again is probably the best way to get the most glute hypertrophy if that's what you're going for. The nice thing about the bridges, again, is that they don't spill over. Like there's only so much squatting and deadlifting you can do, whereas like how much glute bridges can you do? Like I don't even a know. Lot. A lot, yeah. right? And you're, I mean, your glutes – take a lot of punishment. I mean, like you have to walk around all the time. So it's, it's feasible that they may have to sustain higher workloads, kind of like how your abdominal muscles have to sustain higher workloads to really get robust hypertrophy. So it, it stands to reason that you might have to do quite a bit of glute thrust, but you can only do so many deadlifts, right? That's the idea. All right. Omar Hivera with a uh, comment from Doug Schmore. Schmore. Hey, docs, I'm specializing in certain body parts, back in particular. How many measures should I do it before taking a maintenance phase? I'm currently massing and doing as much, quote unquote, right as I can control, so sleep seven, eight hours a night, eat plenty, et cetera. After, also after maintenance phase, is there a good idea to keep specializing in my back? we we'll go to an even spread of training for each muscle group, then do another maintenance phase and probably with a mini cut after, then go back to specializing my back again. Thanks, guys. And Doug Schmore says, Dr. Mike has a video in the lecture series on bringing up lagging body parts. It's actually called bringing up lagging body parts, I think. Um, he talks about a two to one wave. So from what I understand, which could be wrong, two mesos in a row to blast lagging by a part and the meso of maintenance repeat. Great advice. Uh, he gives as always, hope that helps. And then he actually linked it. Very cool. Uh, 40 minutes in this is addressed. Doug, thank you so much for that link. In addition to Doug's comment, um, you know, a two to one, three to one is totally fine. What you don't want to do is to specialize in a body part or a muscle group for so long that it becomes stale, right? So I think a three to one uh, block or sorry, three, a three meso block is the longest James and I would usually write because after three uh, nasty mesocycles for the love of god there's just not much left to give you're going to have to go to maintenance almost certainly anyway to reduce systemic fatigue and systemic volume um sensitization so at that point you definitely back off of your back you don't bang it hard during maintenance which is a common problem james you ever see that people are like maintenance but i'm still we're focusing on my whatever body part and you're like no yeah. that's not what maintenance that doesn't make any sense yeah. It's like trying to get full on a diet. It completely contradicts itself. But I think, yeah, two to one, three to one. And you can even do four to one if you can survive it. But if you're basically in a four to one at the end of that and you're like fourth mesocycle and you're like, man, my back is fucked up. I'm not even hitting PRs anymore. I'm super tired. My elbows hurt. My shoulders hurt. Um, 
what am I doing? The answer is nothing. You should have stopped earlier, James. Yeah. And I was just going to add, like, that's where those mini cuts can become really handy where you can do like two, right? Mini cut. And then you might be able to bang out another two after that. Whereas like trying to do four in a row. Oh man, that's just tough for anybody. So consider using that mini cut tool. If you plan on doing like a more than two to three months at a time to really extend out the length of some of those specialization phases. Yeah. And you can do just one maintenance phase and get back to banging on whatever muscle group is your priority. Just make sure it's actually recovered and actually resensitized. You don't want to go back to a muscle group and just actually not even be excited or trained it anymore. Yeah. Um, just back away from it for a while. Remember, this is largely true. Once you've cemented your gains in a muscle group, they're just going to be there. So don't worry about like, oh, I just have to keep banging it away or it'll shrink. It's not going to shrink. Right? If you find your maintenance volume appropriately, no worries. You can always come back and hit it. Yeah. And more likely than not, your maintenance volume is probably less than you think. So hard to mess up. Yep. Mark Conway says, hi, Michael James, UK super fan here. Awesome. Oi. Oi. Oh, that was Australian. That's both. Oh, it's both. Awesome. Uh, I have a few questions relating to recovery from an injury. Just a bit of background. First, last year I picked up a mild hamstring injury during a hypertrophy block. I think the trigger were walking lunges as I was emphasizing the forward lean to target the glutes more. While I feel slight discomfort during the first rep of my squats and deadlifts, it doesn't negatively affect my performance. Uh, however, I had to avoid stiff leggings and good mornings as I feel a sharp pain during the exercise. Ooh, no good. I feel slight discomfort on some days when walking up hill or stairs, although it does appear to be improving slightly as time goes on. That last part's pretty important. I initially purchased RP powerlifting templates four days and went through a strength phase. I chose not to do any direct hamstring movements so it wouldn't affect my squat and deadlift. I just now completed a metacycle using a hypertrophy jump and I found I was able to perform the deficit deadlifts and hamstring curls without aggravating the injury. That's I great. don't actually compete as a powerlifter despite training I've gone for a couple of years, so I decided to purchase the male physique training templates five days. This is my primary goal is hypertrophy. I now plan to move to the 10 to 20 rep range and having just successfully finished a block in the 6 to 12 rep range using the four-day PL templates. My questions relate to what you guys recommend going forward. First one is would it be best to avoid exercises that cause a bigger stretch uh, e.g. deficit deadlift. So my injury is fully healed. You know, my performance is improving. What I would say, and I, we're going to take these one at a time or I'll give my answer and then James will uh, give his, is uh, any movement that doesn't really cause you any discomfort or pain and biomechanically doesn't look like it's going to be injurious, like deficit deadlifts actually make you bend your knees more and use your hamstrings less than regular deadlifts potentially, just quads more. If it's not bothering your hamstring, I just, I just totally fine, I think, at this stage of your recovery. So I wouldn't worry about it at all. Now, if an exercise is is bothering you, then yes, I think you definitely have a problem. I would say it's just fine. Uh, but if it's a, causing a bigger stretch and it's not fine, like stuff like it does make your shit feel weird, don't fucking do them until things feel better, James. Yeah, I, I largely agree with Mike. I think I would just add on top of that, it's not necessarily the stretch so much as like, just it causing you pain? Like now I would... I would think it would be fair to assume that things that have a bigger stretch component are more likely to cause you pain and discomfort, but that might not necessarily be true. You might find that like doing stiff leg is really uh, are bothersome and doing 45 degree back raise is not for some reason, maybe because yeah. the way it's loaded, maybe because it's a lot lighter, whatever. So uh, I would just, you know, kind of maybe put a caveat on that and say, it's not really the stretch. It's just like, what is actually causing you pain? That's really what you want to avoid. Stretch you know, is usually good for hypertrophy, at least to some uh, reasonable degree. So I wouldn't yeah. necessarily avoid the stretch itself, just avoid the pain. Yeah. And then the second one is, since I can perform a hamstring curl with no issue, should I continue to push from MEV to MRV on this exercise? I would say absolutely yes, yeah. with the reservation that just take it slow and adding sets and adding load. And that actually ties into your next question is, will a 10 to 20 rep range aid recovery more than the 6 to 12 rep range due to lighter loads or is this contra, uh, counteracted by increased volume? So it won't increase recovery anymore, but what it will do is uh, produce a slightly lower risk of uh, injury that occurs at any one time, yes. right? Acute or re-injury because it's just lighter load. So no one rep is probably going to do you in. And by the time you're fatigued enough to really have to try towards the end of the set, the total forces are just not that high and it's probably not going to cause injury. So I actually would say that probably the ideal way to go about this is to do plenty of hamstring curls and whatever compounds for your legs that don't hurt and slowly but surely increase the volume uh, and the weight you're using in that 10 to 20 rep range, probably in that 15 to 20 rep range is better. And as you go weeks and weeks and months and months of that with no issue, slowly get into the heavier weights with hamstring curls in the 10 to 15 range, then get into some lighter um, uh, hip movement, uh, hip hinge movements, like maybe uh, 45 degree back raises or very light good mornings, lighter SLDLs, 
slowly work into that. And as nothing happens and you're fine, deload, deload proactively on the hamstrings. This is one of those post-injury deloading proactively is absolutely the way to go, not reactively. Because reactively, it'll probably just be after you re-injure just it. injury again. Um, exactly. <laughs> the ultimate reactive deload. Uh, so... Uh, plenty of proactive deloads. And then like six months from now, you'll just not even remember you had an injured hamstring and you'll be just back to normal. But it's that like, I've used this general process that I've just described and James probably as well. I don't know how many times with how many muscle groups to the, to the extent I don't even remember all the muscle groups I hurt. It works every fucking time is ease up on the volume. As soon as you get hurt, try the high rep, more isolated movements that don't hurt it or just irritate it a little. Do them with very low volumes until you feel nothing abnormal. Slowly raise intensities and volumes in those higher rep ranges until you're training MEV to MRV in the higher rep ranges with those isolation movements. Then slowly work back into the compounds and then you feel nothing and then you're great and then you're healed. Yeah, very, very good. And uh, just one last note on that. Just be careful. This is going to sound really goofy, especially given that good answer that Mike just said. But um, be easy on the hamstring curls. Hamstring is kind of one of the more exceptional muscle groups in that it's very uh, fast twitch and you can kind of overdo it easier than you might think, especially on an exercise that's relatively easy. And I mean, easy Good comparatively. Advice. So it's one of those where like, if you take out a lot of hip hinge movements because of the injury, and then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to compensate on hamstring curls. You might add one set comparatively than if you were not doing hip hinge movements. It's just one of those where like, you can only do so many hamstring type movements and i would i would be surprised if your mev to mrv window opened up more than like one to two sets in this case you know what i mean so just be easy on the hamstring curls james actually i'm super glad you brought that up um because there's a little bit of a danger here that if you're not training the hamstring movements that are hip hinge and more hardcore you may get that desire to be like okay i'm going to make up for it yes with more volume on yes. the isolations and the problem with that is you that fundamentally that injury could still be a weak spot you might not feel it on the leg curls. And you're going to do so many of them. You're, you never feel it until your cumulative fatigue is so high that one time on the leg curl, it snaps at you. And then what? You're done with all your hamstring training for a while. So great advice, James. And that goes sort of, it dovetails with my advice of like, yeah, MEV to MRV is fine, but start on the very low end and make sure you're never feeling anything weird and go super, super slow. There's no rush. Totally. All right. And he also says, thank you so much for all the content you guys put out. I praise RP to anyone who will listen and you've both gave me a reason to love my daily commute. All, the All right. Well, it's our pleasure. Um, Sean Murakal Rubin says, hello guys, not a question, just a funny comment. I've observed over months of watching webinars, how your voices, especially Mike's change in tone. Every time I bring up static set training, for the record, <laughs> I do use MEV, MAV training and have purchased physique template 2.0. I just have gen pop people. I uh, help slash train who use statics that trainings. Uh, we all do. We all have. Uh, I totally sure. get it. Sure. Uh, so I want to be knowledgeable in that area as well. So I can help the best I can. So actually funny enough, I just wrote this into the upcoming hypertrophy book, um, a whole guide of training, a little like mini guide, uh, James, uh, TLDR. I didn't tell you this yet, but I squeezed that into the individualization chapter right after your sport or um, your training hypertrophy training for sport section. Oh, okay. I think you'll really like it. It's like basically like a 10 step, 10 checklist plan for high STR training, like training in a rush, right? And static That's sets are the way to do that. Like you're not going to expand volume when you're already at your peak number of sets you can do in any one session. So it's absolutely great. The hypertrophy book is a pain in the ass because we keep thinking of other things. Yeah. And we're well, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to wrap it up. Like, all right, book's done. And we're like, oh shit. What right. about the Luckily, we're not interfering with the timeline yet because Mel is uh, editing and we're just doing it during her edits. So we're not right. behind schedule. <laughs> anything. But yeah, so he says, I want to be knowledgeable in that area as well so I can help others best I can. So that section is going to help you a ton because it's going to have a ton of other tips on how to help folks who don't have a lot of time. He says, I just find it funny in a good way when Mike's mouth ever so slightly turns in a frown. I mentioned where static <laughs> yeah. sets. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> sorry about that, Sean. The thing is, it's like a fucking like lizard brain reaction from me talking about MEV, MRV for so long and people reflexively coming back to defend their static sets as great and trying to figure out ways of like, but, but you could just, just manipulate this variable. And it's like my, my sort of like, uh, in Russian, it's called Corona moment. It's like the, my ultimate response to people who go too far down that, well, what about just straight sets is you're arguing so vociferously against adding sets. Every single one of those principles applies to adding weight you seem to not be arguing against that. I've like literally shut down like Instagram threads like that where the guy's like, uh, like, uh, uh, I guess, right. Is he, I'm just so used to like completely ignorant, uh, 
uh, arguments to that. It's probably just a reaction. I'm super sorry I did not direct it. It's all good, all good. All right, number one, actual questions. A couple months ago, I asked you guys if you heard of any medications that might directly affect fat loss pathways as opposed to just affecting things like unconscious need and appetite. On a similar note, and of course I understand this is not necessarily an area of yours, but do you know if there are any medications that blunt or affect muscle growth? I remember reading on certain forums very long time ago before getting way into evidence based community, many people anecdotally claiming that ever since they started A or B medication, most often SSRIs, antidepressants, benzos, et cetera, they have found it extremely difficult to progress in the gym. So I know multiple people who take these who are hitting all time PRs. I find it very highly unlikely. I think uh, a lot of those are going to have more psychological issues than physiological yeah. issues. Yeah. Even when they change nothing about their training, uh, yeah, they might just not be training as hard. You never can tell. Um, do you guys know if any medications directly affect metabolic pathways or similar to fat loss is just more unconscious change of lifestyle factors? I mean, so metformin directly blunts uh, anabolic pathways. Um, it also sensitizes you to insulin. So if you eat a very high carb diet, trade with high volumes and might be worth the effort, but maybe not. It's definitely worth it if you're taking growth hormone, but it's probably not the effort if you're not. Um, so maybe Also like high doses of ibuprofen can do that. For sure. Um, I think that statins, your cholesterol control medications, cause really weird muscular problems. I'm not sure if it's catabolism, but they cause muscle pain. Also, the weird shit. I'm sure tons of medications cause uh, muscle loss or blunting. Of the, ability. the thing is, like, you have to like. <laughs> it's one of those reasons. Uh, it's one of those things where, like, you were given that medication for a reason, and it's probably a more important reason than how much muscle mass that you're carrying around at any given time. You know what I mean? It's one of those like funny things where people get like. Uh, I would just maybe like reevaluate your priorities. Like if somebody's giving you a really powerful drug like that, it's probably because you have a really powerful problem that needs to be addressed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like muscle growth may not be number one. Maybe. Yeah. Muscle growth can sit on the back burner for a minute. Yeah. Number two, probably a super basic question. It's had me scratching my head for a while. We know that training with heavier loads is likely better for faster twitch muscles and training with lighter loads is likely better for slower twitch muscles. But if the entire point of training is to quote unquote, disrupt the body to a it to grow. Wouldn't training a muscle uh, in that way that it's not predisposition to perform uh, well be better? I think that, for example, training faster twitch fibers with heavier weight would simply be training to its strength that the lighter ups would be better since it would be challenge the fibers more. So it actually doesn't challenge the fibers. So remember, we've got two, already two competing hypotheses in your paragraph. John, um, this is all meant in good faith for the uh, um, you know, exercise of just uh, illustrating uh, critical thinking. Uh, you're, well, fuck, man, you're one of our sharpest guys on here, so you'll appreciate this. So if the, you said well, here is the entire point of training to disrupt the body to entice to grow, interesting hypothesis. You also said here later that it would challenge the fibers more. So what are, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to disrupt more or are we trying to challenge more, right? So like, you know, if you had uh, someone who was trying to get better at wrestling, what would challenge them more, going against a world champ or going against like 12 weasels? Well, the weasels would fucking tear his ass up. I'm not so sure that would make you better at wrestling. So maybe it's not disruption. Disruption is definitely a, a byproduct. There may be some local disruption that we want to the fiber specifically. But remember, local disruption is much better when the fibers actually contract and produce tons of force. The fibers we want and or get enough volume. Here's the problem with heavy load training for low volumes. It's probably not enough volume to stimulate a lot of growth in the slower twitch fibers. It's the right idea, but just not enough of it, right? The problem with um, uh, lighter load training for the faster twitch fibers is that they're sort of used the entire time the lighter load training is done, but not without a ton, without a lot of contraction, but they sum up metabolites and even from surrounding fibers and from themselves. So that by the time they get to the higher ups going close to failure, they probably reach failure really quick and not failure because they can't produce a ton of tension anymore. They never really got to produce a ton of tension. They just get inundated with metabolites and actually literally, they literally freeze up, right? So it's been shown that uh, fast twitch activation at high reps close to failure is actually much lower than we thought because they take a ton of fatigue from metabolites. So it never gives them the ability to be challenged. So the, the, the goal with training is it's actually a combination of specificity and overload. We'll bring in variation here in a second. The specificity is do what the muscle does that you're targeting or the fiber does that you're targeting best. The second one is do that hard, right? So do multiple sets of very heavy weight for faster twitch fibers, really tons of sets of tons of reps of lighter weight for lower weight fibers or uh, fat, a slower twitch fibers, so on and so forth. Here is where that... Uh, the disruption uh, in a way that it's not predisposed to comes in, that's just variation. So after you train anything in a certain way, even in the optimal way, it just becomes resistant to hypertrophy. Uh, so then maybe if you've been training your faster fibers a lot recently, changing it to training with higher reps can train your, train your slower twitch fibers more, and all of a sudden they're growing better, which means you're backing off on the faster twitch fibers and letting them resensitize, and then you're going to be hitting them hard later again. So that's definitely a thing. But we just have to remember that the disruption has to occur in the way that challenges the fibers more. 
and the heavy load versus higher reps probably concomitantly challenge those fibers the best way possible. Otherwise, it's like um, trying to ride your bike at 90 miles an hour or trying to become a race car driver driving at uh, 15 miles an hour. Like you switch the raw two wrong things. You should have switched those two, James. Yeah. And uh, so that answer was really great. I'm just trying to think of like a scenario where you could flip the script that makes sense. And it's one of those where, where if you do like a what's it called a sanity check on that idea it just kind of falls apart where it's like, okay, so am I going to try and use the thing that's meant to do? Like, like you said, like, am I going to use the race car to do the marathon or am I going to use like, you know, the, the, uh, the moped to do the drag race, you know? So it, like, it just doesn't work out. So however you wanted to even approach that alternate hypothesis in the real world, it just, you'd just be doing a lot of nothing, unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, but it's a good question. I appreciate it. It might give a great answer. Question. And then he says, follow up to party. Uh, you guys say they're a good proxy for determining an exercise is hitting a, a muscle well as the pump because the pump indicates disruption to the muscle. That is also it, itself independently uh, anabolic. And it, it may not indicate as much of a disruption as it indicates a huge intramuscular metabolite summation, which water might go into and pump up to basically diffuse. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly indicates some disruption as well. I'm assuming when you say proxy for that it includes all factors like loading zone slash intensity as well. Uh, okay, so we'll see where we're going for that. The assumption is true. My layman brain would again think it would be the opposite. If faster twitch fibers are really good at heavier weight, then why would uh, something they're proficient in cause greater disruption? Something they're bad at. So, but that's exactly it. So, is SR seventy one Blackbird right? It flies at Mach two point you know seven one or some shit like that. Um, you know that's great. Uh, how do you disrupt the Blackbird's engines? We well, sure as hell don't turn them on slow for a while. You fucking blast them and it disrupts the fuck out of them, but they're also great at that, right? Because they can produce so much force that it's very disruptive, right? Uh, in, in, in you take like a, a lawnmower engine, it can only produce so much force. You're just not blasting it. How do you disrupt it? Well, you just turn it on for a long time and then it eventually causes a lot of damage just by staying on for a long time. That's like the slow twitch component. So the thing is that faster fibers, the way they produce disruption is summing up a shitload of intracellular metabolites, causing physical mechanical damage through high tension. How do you do both of those? You have to activate the fuck out of them, which means super high forces, ideally, uh, right off the bat. And number two is through putting a shitload of tension, which again means activation. So it's only when they feed into their best uses that they can be disrupted the most. It's not like they just get disrupted by anything they're not used to. Right. And so you can also think of it this way, Sean, um, in that the muscle fiber types have different overload threshold criteria right? And that's why they differ between the different activities, right? So your type two fibers literally don't generate robust hypertrophy unless they are challenged in like those anaerobic high force uh, activities and vice versa. Like your type ones are so good at doing oxidative and like long, slow distance type stuff, their threshold is actually doing a really hard version of that. And that's when you'll actually see more, or excuse me, increases in protein turnover and stuff like that. So it's not just the outcome, it's actually the input as well in this case. So the reason why they uh, respond better is because you actually have to challenge them in a way that they're already good at. So that's the idea. So that the overload criteria for those fibers, if they're, they're not uniform across all muscle fibers. They're slightly different within each kind of fiber type. You could think of it that way. Yeah. And just making things better by doing things they're not used to is, is a problem in the directionality of training too. That's a specificity violation. Imagine we took uh, top caliber wrestlers and made them do distance running. Would that make them better at wrestling? No, not really. Uh, it would make them a little bit better at running, but it wouldn't even make them that much better at running because they suck at running. They're not even in shape to it run. It would just fuck them up. They, they would just get shin splints and yeah. actually wouldn't even increase their cardio ability much in the first couple of sessions because their shin splints would stop them before their lungs and heart did. So yeah. they're better off wrestling more than running. And if we wanted running to improve their cardio, we'd have to have onboard them first. So that's something to keep in mind. Number three, just an update to anyone whom, who, whom? I struggle with anyone that too. Feel your pain. Anyone who, I think it's who might benefit. Who, who might, might benefit. benefit. Yeah. Oh, it might benefit. Anyone whom it might benefit. Uh, ooh, I'm not sure. Good question. Or you could say anyone who might benefit. Yep. To anyone who might benefit. You guys might remember a few months ago, I complained about unbearable foot pain while doing calf exercises. Yes. And you guys said it sounded like plantar fasciitis. I went to my physical therapist, found a very intelligent guy, PhD, that actually... Uh, I wonder if he has a PhD or if he has a physical therapy doctor. And a bunch of certifications, so definitely trust him. And he said, it isn't actually plantar fasciitis. Now, I'm not a physical therapist, so I did my best to follow along. But the gist I took away is that it's something to do with all the motor units and my calves not activating properly. Okay. 
especially factoring in the recent discovery that the calf muscle itself actually extends all the way down to the leg and wraps underneath the foot, which blew my mind. Okay. And combined with testing that shows that I have absolutely horrible single leg balancing abilities, he said that my calf isn't doing a good job at activating all its motor units properly. Hopefully that made sense. Not really. So anyways, uh, <laughs> now we're doing... Think of the same thing like... Ah. Now we're doing single leg balancing and functional stability training to train my calves to properly activate. Sounds like bullshit. And I think it seems to be working. I just found it fascinating. Hopefully it might be able to help someone else. Thank you. If, so yeah, I mean, if it's working, that's great. I, I, I would be a little skeptical of that uh, personally, but it's one of those things like it's kind of hard How to argue with if it's working. So, not, okay. Right. How does not activating a muscle cause you pain? And also like the, 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 I mean, the connective tissues with the, the calf muscles can reach down towards the foot, but the, the actual muscle belly is, I might have to do a double check on that, but I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't actually go into the foot. There are intrinsic foot muscles, um, but I don't believe that that's part of the calf. I might have, I might be wrong on that, but that's my suspicion. Mike, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Dude. Yeah. Fuck. I that. think they end largely at the ankle. Uh, I don't think yeah. they go into the bottom your, your feet outside of, you know, like where the ankle is. Um, so I'm a little suspicious pretty, of that, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Pretty, uh, pretty out of our, our of depths, but sure sounds interesting. Of all the related stuff we know to physical therapy, I would raise an eyebrow at that. But hey, it's worth it. If it's getting better, it might even be getting better for completely different reasons, but you know, I, would, I would definitely go along with it. It's worth a try. Tim Moores uh, says, hi, guys. After completing almost every book of RP, are there any other books from the author, from other authors you would recommend? Yeah, the rest of the books from RP, God damn it, I'm just kidding. Um, books that are really informative and are useful for training or dieting. Yeah, so all of Eric Helms' book, The Muscle Strength Pyramids, Omri Suf and Greg Knuckles' books, uh, Art and Science of uh, Lifting, uh, Brad Schoenfeld's Hypertrophy text, which just got republished in edition number two, uh, is where I would go to next. And all of Chad Wesley Smith's Juggernaut Training books, there's so many and they're so great. James? Yeah, this is one we answer a lot. So if you guys are watching the my screen share, you'll see it says address briefly, please. And that's on purpose because we, we, we tend to get this one seemingly every other week. So those are all really good. And then if you have all the RP books, there's actually more than a few textbooks listed in all of the references of the RP books. So that would be yes. another really good place to start. James, what's the book that you co-author called? Uh, Integrated Periodization. That's the short yeah. version of it. Tim, um, get ready for a beefy book. That thing is intellectually intense. It's going to cover all of sport training. So have fun. Holy shnikes. And James is a co-op. All right. Brandon Armstrong said, I asked this question last week, but you guys mentioned that you thought I answered on a previous video a few weeks back. I checked all the webinars going back to mid-December and even searched for channel for any guides on forum training. Uh, there are none. Uh, there were a couple of questions regarding forums with nothing to do in depth that answered my questions, at least that I could find that being said. The first question is copy pastes, so please forgive Rewrite of any bad jokes. I also had a few more questions come to mind since then, so I threw them all in there as well. All right. I need to strengthen my forearms for powerlifting and future BJJ purposes. Double overhead grip hasn't gotten much, if any, stronger. So I think uh, maybe I've reached a point where I might need to do some targeted grip training in proper fashion. Also, I kind of like my forearms to be better match the size of my upper arms. I assume I would like to select exercise for both BJJ and powerlifting. Uh, what would you suggest to be good exercise options? For strength and also hypertrophy purposes, in the past I've had a hard time selecting for exercise for this. Also, if any of them have any isolation exercise like bar holds, how do you structure reps? So the way you structure reps for a bar hold is just time, weight and time. So you hold them for, you know, whatever. Uh, you time yourself. You start time and you see how, the, you know, once you know like three to five seconds left and you let go, stop. Notice the time, write it down. And then next time you have a goal time to beat by a little, by a little, by a little. And after you uh, exceed a certain amount of time, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds, depending on your target, you increase the weight on the bar and you progress like that. So time holds are fine. I don't find them to be super duper effective. What I would say is to do a variety of wrist curls are a really good idea, especially ones in which you let the dumbbell slide down towards your fingertips on the way down. So you do it off of a, a bench. Um, and, and curl all the way up and slide down, good eccentric control. Uh, standing wrist curls where you do the same thing with a barbell or a cable machine, those are really good. And I would also recommend gripper work. A gripper work is really, really good because like, so the Iron Mind Captains of Crush Gripper, you might want to start with a trainer and then buy the number one. And once you can close the grippers for reps, close them for reps and they're really good. And slowly but surely your grip should improve. Careful with fatigue management. Monitor your performance. Don't just do grip. So I just do grip training, never write anything down, and they've been getting weaker for weeks because the grip can be overreached, not because it's not volume tolerant. It is because you use it so goddamn much. So I would absolutely uh, focus on that sort of thing. 
Yeah, those are all really good recommendations. So, you know, you already probably picked this up from what Mike said, but mostly you're focusing on kind of like the wrist and finger flexors at this point. I wouldn't really spend too much time doing any of the extensor type forearm exercises. And then what we find is that it this operates the same way that most periodization practices operates where you have a phase that's focused on hypertrophying those gripping muscles, right? And all those exercises that Dr. Mike listed are good. You can use virtually the same rep ranges and stuff too, right? Like 10 to 20, 5 yeah. to 30, any of that stuff, same thing applies, right? Once you eventually make a transition into like your specific preparatory period, whether it's for powerlifting or BJJ, either one's same idea, right? You switch to things that are harder. So that's when you might start to do more holds. You might start to use the grippers and you might be doing things in like the four to F, excuse me, four to eight rep range, something like that, where you're really increasing the force output, really decreasing the reps so you can increase the intensity. And then towards the end, as you move into like your peaking or competition phases, you might actually start taking out a lot of direct grip work unless you still find that it's a big limiting factor. And you might just focus on the grip work that you get from the training, like picking up the deadlift and stuff like that, or the jujitsu that you're doing in your, your competitive training. And that's probably good enough at that point, unless it's still clearly a limiting factor, but you could also make an argument and you know, Dr. Mike can chime in on this. If your grip is still a limiting factor, by the time you make it to the competition portion of your annual plan, like, ah, oh, man, it's, it's already too late at that point. There's not really a whole yeah. lot that you can do. So at that point, it's just more of a fatigue management thing. Do your best and, you know, attack it hard again the next time. Yeah. Last thing you have to say is when you're choosing your reps, uh, sorry, choosing the time, if you're doing timed holds, I would treat every, sec uh, every rep as one to two second equivalent. So like a five to 10 rep effort with a timed hold is between uh, five and 20 seconds, depending on how you want to count, count that. Yeah. Number two, I've noticed during purchase phases, as I near 20 weekly sets for most body parts, I just have more trouble sleeping in regards to quality with a slight drop off in time slept as well. However, I still feel fine when I'm lifting and honestly feel stronger at this point than at the beginning of the mezzo currently on week five. So at least in terms of performance in the gym, it doesn't feel like I'm starting to under recover. This seems to be my only symptom that I notice, and I usually finish the episode about 20 weeks, that's on average for most body parts due to this. Is it possible that since this is my only symptom that I'm, maybe I'm not under-recovering? Well, actually, you're by definition not under-recovering because you're hitting PRs. Um, but running performance doesn't seem too effective either when I train. Well, it depends on what you mean by too effective. If it goes down, then that's an issue. We'll see when you get there. So I really can't tell if I'm really at my MRV. MRV is a folks. Public service announcement, MRV is <laughs> preposterously easy to figure out. The week you start to underperform on stuff is when you've hit, you likely hit your MRV. If you Especially, haven't, uh, but I'll, I'll, go ahead, James. Well, I was saying he's doing like, a, clearly he's doing like a concurrent lifting and running uh, yeah. training program. You hit your MRV sure, when yeah. all of your training modalities start going down, at least. I will tell you, man, it's tough to say if you haven't, if you've underperformed, you might have hit your MRV. It won't, might be just an instant. But if you aren't underperforming, you have not hit your MRV. So there's a definitely like, there's no like, what is that? There's no uh, false negatives with MRV. Okay. Type two. Just don't exist. Yeah. yeah. Like you think you've hit MRV, but you haven't. Uh, that's not a thing because you shouldn't be thinking that. Uh, if there's no underperformance, you for sure haven't hit MRV. Uh, and he says, I wanted to get you guys' thoughts on this and help me. Oh, sorry. He says, uh, yep. I wanted to get you guys' thoughts on. Uh, uh, on this, helping me determine if I'm really hitting my MRV. Nope, you're not. I do occasionally go through periods where sleep is difficult for one or two weeks at a time. So, do you think moderate decreases in sleep other than uh, missed or out recovery from sleep is enough to stop a measure even though performance is still increasing? No, it's absolutely not, James. Uh, yeah, so what you're probably experiencing more likely than anything is just um, overreaching symptoms. Just right? higher systemic fatigue. Yeah, yeah so uh, sleep disturbances are like a classic overreaching thing and overreaching doesn't necessarily mean that you are in the danger zone. It just means that, yeah, you're putting in a really substantial amount of work, maybe a combination of the lifting and the running. Um, so it's not uncommon for people to have sleep disturbances when they are kind of teetering on that overreaching thing. So that's probably what you're experiencing, especially like if it goes away after you deload and then your sleep goes back to normal, classic, classic symptom. That's like textbook overreaching kind of stuff. So it means you're close to your systemic MRV, but you're just clearly not at it, which is, which is fine. Good. Yeah. Keep on going. I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. 
With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Number three, depending on your answer number two, the answer to this one would be pointless, but I'm posting it anyway. Regarding mesolinks, I find I usually make it to at least five weeks, if not more, before I start to notice any symptoms of reaching MRV. However, when I start a new meso, I still get quite sore, and, it's, and it is usually rather challenging with decent pumps, despite being the lowest volume of the meso, so I don't think I'm starting too low. Yeah, I would agree. Usually around 10 to 12 weekly sets, depending on the muscle group of 3 RIR. I currently increase weekly sets by two per week. Stop doing that. Do it in an auto-regulated fashion. You have to increase by number of sets. But the set progression algorithm and RP website tells you, which is for lack of a better term, like, are you recovering well? If yes, increase sets by however much you're recovering by. And relative intensity for three up to about one RAR, three each meso. I was wondering if you guys think I might benefit from being a bit more aggressive volume progression. And if so, what a recommendation would be. I think you need to do it in an auto-regulated fashion, which will tell you exactly how aggressive you should be. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. Like, I... Because even like sometimes even increasing like two sets per week per muscle group would be considered an aggressive, already yeah. an aggressive approach, right? And it really just depends on, on you yourself. So just to go back to what Dr. Mike was saying there, you know, I don't think it's, it's like inherently bad to have like a pre-programmed two set increase per week if you know that that is typically how your mesocycle progresses very consistently. But I still think what Mike said is probably the better answer, which is like auto regulation is probably better. So, so like... Um, that type of prescription is is perfectly fine if you're using it in conjunction with auto regulation, right? Yeah. And so if you're just using it as a blank, like two per week, you could be overdoing it or you could be underdoing it. And in this case, it, it, you might be underdoing it if you're suspect, suspecting that you're not quite getting up to MRV at the five week mark or the four week mark. So, cool. Number four, I asked a question a while back about rep ranges for hypertrophy for powerlifting purposes, and you guys said. Uh, five rep sets are also on the table. Mm -hmm. I just want a clarification on this. So I make sure I'm not butchering the message. If I were to start a meso at 10 rep sets and by the end have worked toward five rep sets, increasing specifically through the meso, if I'm not wrong, the roughly 20 ish weekly sets. Does that sound like a likely bad idea? It might at 20 weekly sets. Um, I think it's probably okay on paper. What I would prefer is you did a meso where you had things that are exercises that start in the five-ish rep range and the 10-ish rep range and everything in between, you just increase weights and volumes on them slowly and kept the rep ranges roughly the same. Then another mezzo you did in the sort of four to six or four to seven range and yes. then another mezzo in the lower ranges. That way, because adding that much weight to the bar while adding volume can really throw off your recovery by adding a little too much of both uh, as far as sets and uh, weight at the same time. Yeah. So just keep in mind. So like, if you were to say like our five set, uh, excuse me, five rep sets. Okay. For, you know, hypertrophy and powerlifting, like it's a, it's a yes, but it's at the bottom end of yes. You know, it's like as far down the, the yes ladder as you can go. So it's like Mike said, it's probably better to operate within some ranges that are kind of hitting a spectrum on, on average of whatever rep range goal that you're hitting. So, you know, one, uh, you might have a phase that is kind of within five to 10 where you might hit like eight, six, you know, seven type sets, things like that. You might have another phase that's between like four to six. So on average, you're hitting around five, but not necessarily a hard five. Things like that are probably a better strategy than just using a set by rep and assuming that you can make linear increases in um, intensity and or volume across that massive cycle. Cause that's just unrealistic in my experience. Number five, I'm ending hypertrophy mesos at five rep sets. Again, okay, so like, ah, it's killing me. Sorry, I can't right. let it go. It's not that you're just doing sets of five. I just want to make that clear. So like, can you do sets of five for hypertrophy? Yes. Should you be just saying, I am doing sets of five for hypertrophy? Probably not best practice. That's the idea here, right? So yeah. Sets of five are okay as the bottom end, right? Pro but like, you know, like maybe like, uh, five to 10 for a mezzo one, like four to eight, four to six for mezzo two, something like that. Like at that point, you're starting to teeter into that strength range. So yeah. uh, just to be very clear on this, we're not advocating that you, we do sets of five for hypertrophy all the time necessarily. It's something that you can do, but it's not necessarily something that you should do exclusively. Yeah. So he actually gets into this exact question. If I'm ending my hypertrophy mezzo at five rep sets, that makes me question what I thought 
I would do rep range wise for strength phases and scientific principles of strength training. You guys mentioned the percentages. We didn't cover that I found RER and rep range in regarding the strength phases. What you guys recommend as a good range to work with for strength phases. Uh, I have always been a little fuzzy about where to start strength work, quote unquote, and what point the rep range is better suited for peaking. Well, like, you know, sets of five to 10 are really like if we're talking powerlifting terms, six to 10 is good for strength, uh, hypertrophy. Sets of three to six are good for general strength. Uh, that would be where we would do strength work and sets of one to three are good for peaking. Are you, That's are about it. Answer. You know, and like in, you know, for kind of traditional sports, we would use five to 10 as kind of like a transition zone and a hypertrophy zone. And then they would move into like, you know, slightly less increments, like four to eight, maybe three to five, and then maybe one to three if they were really doing some like maximal strength type stuff. But for powerlifting, you kind of shift all that down a little bit, more, a little more concisely. Harrison Caton says, hello, is Dr. Mike and James. Thank you for answering my questions last week. They were really helped clarify some things. By the way, my last name is pronounced Caton. Cool. Yeah, glad we helped. I'm glad we got your name figured out. My question this week is that intro to sport exercise science just dropped on YouTube. In it, Dr. Mike, may, you can make mention of RPU. You explained uh, well enough that what that is in the video. However, I wasn't able to find anything on RP strength or by Google. Is there an RPU standalone site? No. Also, where the test equations you mentioned, not yet created. Uh, the RPU thing is a very long-term project. So nothing yet. But all the knowledge is there. So there you go. that will eventually very likely be a reality. But we're still building all the courses out. Second, I pulled Sumo and recently did some heavy block pull singles. I was able to pull 605 pretty easy for an RP8 off a three-inch block for Sumo. What's the percentage compared to a deadlift off the ground? Uh, depends on how big the blocks are. And it depends on the lifter a ton. So no, no good answer there. Um, and it says EGMX block pull should be one or 5% heavier than pull from the floor. Most of the times when you see people make those numbers, they're making them up um, you know, or just a place to sort of roughly start. But you already know where to roughly start because you already know an RPE and a weight and a block. So you have more information than we can ever give you. Also, a word to the wise, uh, block pulls for sumo do almost nothing for almost no one because that lift is harder <laughs> off the floor. And you can always sumo pull I know people who had max deadlifts in the 650s who sumo block pulled a thousand plus and did a fucking thing for them. Yeah. So I think just to kind of get back into like what the actual question is asking, right? So it's like, can you use that recommendation? It's like, ah, eh, maybe, maybe not. But like the bigger question is like, why are you using the block pull, right? Yeah. You're using the block pull to emphasize a slightly different range of motion and to probably use more weight than you normally could. So a reasonable answer would be, you know, kind of, uh, greater than 100% of the same reps and RIR goals that you would do off of the floor would be like a reasonable answer because if the whole point is to overload a particular range of motion with more weight than you normally could do, that's really the answer. And then after that, it's kind of just guess and check because it's pretty easy to overdo it. I agree with Mike on that last comment though about uh, block pulls for sumo. I think that's okay kind of thing like rack pulls for conventional stuff like that. That's probably fine. But man, for sumo, it doesn't seem to be a good use of your time. Daniel Hacker says, so I had this issue happen to me a few times and I'd like your help in attempting to fix it unless it doesn't need to be. Whenever I do dumbbell split squats, after the first set or two, my body incurs this feeling of nausea and bubble guts. <laughs> my legs are fine. My heart isn't beating too fast. It just seems like I put the dumbbells down a minute or so into my rest period. Slight nausea ensues. Sure, the set is hard, but I'm not at zero RIR. I've had to cap my workout for this exercise at two sets her leg and add another quad move for additional volume in the session because if I didn't the exercise would just take too long to complete for me that's inefficient is there a way to fix this once again I don't feel it's cardiovascular I don't feel like my legs have absolutely nothing left in the set also I do this after RDLs and calves that obviously doesn't help but uh, that's how cookie crumbles in my program right now what does the nausea feeling happen side note your boy is getting up there 80 in the chance for 14 reps each leg post both sets well when you lift a ton of weight with a huge muscle mass which is what you're doing and you're a really big guy now you incur a shitload of total body acidosis and that will just cause you to want to fucking throw up. So yeah. just stop getting bigger and stronger. Uh, really welcome to the club because a lot, most of us deal with that kind of shit all the time. Uh, Charlie vomits almost tries had dry heaves almost every leg workout. Uh, I, dry, I dry heave in probably about a third of them. Uh, so shit sucks, man. Fucking nut up. There's probably no way around it. Uh, <laughs> not not <up>. eating. <laughs> A lot or not eating at all doing these fast in the morning workouts definitely helps a lot. So it's something you can look into later, but that would be my number one guess. Yeah. You have kind of the, um, 
added benefit of having a relatively unstable compared to like a squat or something, but it's like an unstable type movement when you do it with one leg. And so what you also get with those unstable movements is a lot of just uh, muscle activation that's not necessarily contributing to the force output of the muscle action in question. So when you do that, you also are just getting a lot of spastic kind of stabilizing type activity in a lot of the other muscles, the antagonist and agonist and unrelated muscles, just to keep yourself in position. So what you are doing is basically activating a shitload of muscle mass and you're a relatively big strong guy using a lot of weight so now you're just activating so much stuff that you're getting this acidosis effect and that's most likely what's causing it so mike already hit on that but it's you could you could you can look at um you you see this a lot with cyclists who do like sprint cycling uh one of the most painful things yeah watching jeff do the fucking bike ergometer was awful uh watching somebody like mike and charlie do leg press and then somebody like yourself if you got like really really big legs or really big hips and you're doing that single leg thing and you're getting a lot of muscle activation yeah it just happens it's normal and yeah, uh, danny's dan's jack now man he's a fucking big dude that makes perfect sense dude. he he got uh, the steroid hack he's, he's not he, he uh just upgraded big time hack zor hack zor i'm just kidding um that's great i haven't seen him in a while i know you yeah, bumped into him in florida uh huge huge arms Sweet. Good problem. Samuel L. Jackson. Excellent. Oh, I says, hi, Docs. I've got a question about lactose intolerance. You know, it's 2020. Let's start being tolerant of lactose, folks. It's yeah, just a molecule. My girlfriend is quite sensitive to lactose, uh, and she gets diarrhea after consumption, so she thinks she has got lactose intolerance. She went to the doctor with uh, the problem, um, who said she should try to avoid consumption without any further explanation. She now tries to avoid consumption, which is quite difficult sometimes, especially since she doesn't know for sure she is intolerant. Is there any way to test if she is? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, That's actually a quick question for the doctor, but Samuel actually later says she's got a new appointment with the doctor coming up soon. Um, Would like to know a bit more to ask the right questions. Just tell her to ask for a direct test of lactose intolerance. I think that's something that you can, I mean, like there are food allergy tests that have direct tests that you can just ask for and take. So I think that's something that you can do. And then, uh, so we'd love your input. Also, could you guys recommend any sources for more information? You can read about lactose intolerance in almost anywhere. Wikipedia is a good start. Uh, And then he says here that she found a lactase tablet on the internet, which are supposed to counter the problems associated with consumption. In the case she goes out for dinner, that would be nice. Those work. Because you never know for sure that there are some dairy used in the cooking process. Do you guys know if there's a viable option? If you have lactose intolerance, it's a super fucking viable option. It's a miracle cure. It just gets rid of it completely for several hours. How does Dr. Mike handle lactose intolerance? I don't take the lactose tabs because my shit's not that bad. Unless I'm drinking whole milk for some fucking reason. Um, so then I can. I have eaten them before. They work great. I just buy, uh, I don't know where you're from, Samuel, but in the, in the United States, we have um, uh, lactose. lactose-free fucking everything. So I just get lactose-free milk. I can have all the cheeses and cakes and that doesn't bother me. But uh, if the lactase tablet... Uh, if she tests it, like has a glass of milk with a lactase tablet, like, you know, 10 minutes after the lactase tablet, she drinks a, gla- a glass of milk and she doesn't have diarrhea. She almost certainly has lactose intolerance. I would actually just do that at home test. Stay at home because in case the lactose uh, isn't what's doing it, then she's still going to get Dude. diarrhea and you're going to be out and, out and about. Wear white. That's all I got to say. Wear I, white. I used to have intolerance and somehow I grew out of it. But when I would have milk, just even skim milk, I mean, I would get like gassy, explosive spray. It was awful. I still get that. I do you? Don't drink milk. Yeah, and I have I, to have lactose free. Do you, would you get like butt chafing? Yeah, for sure, man. And you like... You, oh, you, man. It's it was awful. awful. Man. Yeah. Awful. And it, like your, like, your stomach doesn't, it hurts before you fart. There's a huge bloating. It's crazy. Yeah. I would get, this is like super TMI for listeners, but like if you guys know the feeling of like when your groin is chafed from like walking around too much or something like that, I would get that like in my ass. And for whatever reason it went away over time, but I was using the lactase stuff for a while. And that, that definitely helped me out a lot. I think yeah. I literally just had enough cytogainer with milk to my body was like, you know what? Just fuck it. We're making this bacteria. (laughs) We're on board. All right. Steve Blair says, Hey docs, just started a mini cut and have knocked my volumes down slightly from my last mini cut to see if I'm above my MV can get away with less volume. If I finish my cut without any loss in rep strength, presuming that wouldn't indicate I've lost any muscle and was still above my MV. Correct. It's a very short time. So it's hard to tell, but yeah, if you don't lose any strength, I would say you're probably fine. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard, too, because like sometimes the fatigue of dieting might just be enough to have a, a shitty day every now and again. But yeah, I think for the most part, that's, that's pretty spot on. I normally use my mini cut volumes as a starting volumes to my subsequent bulking meso since the extra calorie should roughly bump MV up to MEV. 
Uh, wait, volumes. sorry, I have to reread that. If I normally use my mini cut volumes as a starting volumes for my subsequent bulking meds, though, since the extra calories, uh, it might actually extra be calories less. Go the other way. Yeah, I was gonna say it might actually be your your MEVs might actually be less. Yeah. Then he says, if I don't lose rep strength on my mini cut, would it be okay to reduce the starting volumes on my bulk too? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. We are we just use the the ghetto stimulus estimator algorithm. Where you go off pumps and uh, summarize some eye muscle connection and stuff like that. That's probably better. Like if you feel like you're getting a, a workout, then it's probably good. If you feel like it's way too little, there's no way, and that you don't get sore, and nothing happens. It's probably not enough. Yeah. No. Number two, looking at the sample programs on the new hypertrophy guides, I noticed that the starting volumes for exercises go up at the start of each meso, but extra movements are also added to increase frequency. Is the extra volume from the new exercises not enough of a volume increase? to overcome the increased MEV of later mesocycles by itself. It can be if you increase less volume and don't add exercises, but there are other reasons for adding exercises, including variation and the specificity of using certain exercises and certain rep ranges and the problem of continuing with very heavy exercises as opposed to adding in exercises in the lighter rep range. So if you've read the guides, you know everything I'm talking about. Right now. And, and not to mention not like – you start to peter out like how much you probably benefit from any single exercise yes. a little bit over time. Your MEVs just go up really high yep. on that. And also like if you say, okay, there's only so many sets you can do per exercise per session. Even if you split it up in multiple sessions, now you're dealing with the problem of doing the same exercise like three sessions in a row. Like why not add another exercise? Right? Yeah. So you don't have to add another exercise. It's just a very good tool by which to add volume and mitigate a bunch of other things. Sorry, we can leave this one alone, but it's also a really good strategy for – kind of transitioning into the higher rep phases later on too. Like when uh, introducing something like a leg press in meso two uh, is not a bad idea if you're going to be doing like metabolite leg press in meso three versus like yep. just sticking with high bar squat the whole time. You know what I mean? Yep. Like that. yep, exactly. And he says adding sets to old and new movements seems to be a big jump in starting meso set volumes. It's, so this just just an example. It's just a sample. Some people have a pretty gnarly adaptation curve where they their MEV goes up by like three to five sets per mesocycle until they do a desensitization phase. That's a thing. So if it's too much for you, absolutely do less, right? Folks, remember, sample programs are just examples, and there's tons of people to whom they will absolutely Mike, break down this later. example to, its, to the T, dot the I's and cross the T's for me on this right. example. Exactly. Why so did you do this? What? We have good reasons, but they may not apply to you in your specific case, so make sure not to do too much of it. That's a good question. Th- it's like, why? Very good question. Because when you see something dramatic, because we've actually advocated for um, like not making that change within a mesocycle on the webinars before. So when yeah. you'd see it across mesocycles, it would seem weird. Like, yeah, so it's a good yeah. question. Exactly. Number three, the new hypertrophy guides mentioned that rep ranges should be kept at the same for movements from meso to meso. Uh, yeah, not should be, but that's a good idea. Um, since I've got limited equipment to preserve variation, I've been keeping the same movements, but increasing rep ranges gradually over several mesos. That's fine. I'm not going to introduce new movements. Would it be better starting with a greater mix of rep ranges and just keeping them constant over the mesos instead, e.g. rather than progressing three movements for a body part over three mesos from 6 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. Instead, just have movement one always 6 to 10, always 10 to 20, and one always 20 to 30. I get you a blend of that, actually. Have a couple of sets of each. So have squats. Let's say you have hack squats, uh, squats, hack squats, leg presses. Squats, you could do most of the sets six to 10, one or two of the sets 10 to 20. Leg presses, you could do a couple of the sets six to 10, a couple 10 to 20, and a couple 20 to 30. Hack squats, you can do uh, one set six to 10, maybe zero. Uh, uh, one or two sets in 10 to 20, and most of the sets of 20 to 30. So there's a way for you to have kind of a mix of all worlds. Yeah, and if you if you are working with limited equipment, um, sometimes it is good to to... to alter those rep ranges a little bit across the different phases where like you might have meso one, you're doing squats six to 10. You can lighten up the load a little bit, just a little and still be in largely that same rep range and meso two. So you might do six to 10 and then like eight to 12, right? Which is like a two rep average difference where you're kind of lightening the load a little bit to accommodate like the, the length of the diet and the fatigue associated with that. Um, you can do the same thing where you might be like emphasizing the 10 to 15 
portion of the 10 to 20 rep range and then like the 15 to 20 portion of that 10 to 20 rep range like yeah. same idea kind of like little sub uh breakdowns within those rep ranges i mean it's we like to use them as kind of like these three right but you can get creative if you don't have a lot of equipment and like like if, if you don't have a legs press hack squat and you know other other pieces of equipment if you're like okay we'll have squats and other like barbell quad variations yeah do one that's like six to ten and then maybe eight to twelve on a different day and then you get to the next phase and it's eight to twelve and then maybe ten to fifteen you know you can do things like that too. That's fine. Yep. In past webinars, you mentioned that 10 sets are a rough guide for the maximum per session volume of muscle group uh, before definitely considering upping frequency. Is there a minimum number of sets that would suggest reducing frequency and combining session give my better res might give better results? Yeah, anything below two to three. Like if you've got one workout with one set, another workout with two and another with three, for the love of God, just do two fucking workouts and do three in each. Yeah, I agree with that. Number five, I'm struggling for hip hinge variations in my home gym. Would changing the stance width on RDLs be considered enough variation? Yeah, totally. Sure. Stance width and foot positions. Go sumo RDLs, conventional RDLs, wide grip, wide RDLs, snatch grip RDLs, and different foot, foot, foot positions. Sometimes you can have RDLs with your feet six inches apart. Sometimes with your feet, uh, you know, uh, 18 inches apart. Uh, toast Deficits, pointer door out, yeah. uh, good mornings. Fuck, man, you got all kinds of variations. And then sometimes it's nice to have different barbells. Like if you have a cambered bar, you can do, you know, like regular stance, good morning, cambered bar, good morning, like yep. boom, stuff like that, really easy. Yep. All right. Josh Koshi <laughs> says, hi, high jump dunk guy again. I, 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 for a second, I thought it said drunk guy again. And I was I like, wait, what? Josh, you've been Isn't drinking that, and asking that's me. plus questions. Yeah, <laughs> only one drunk man. For my year-long jumping journey, I'm avoiding the butts. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's good. It was just funny. It's just he's making me laugh. I'm avoiding the blender effect by simply programming distinct phases, basically along the force velocity curve of the uh, pyramid of James references in RP Plus video, strength, endurance, maximal strength, strength, power, power. I have strength, endurance, maximal strength, and power covered. Uh, however, the one phase that I'm having difficulty programming is strength, power. I have seven weeks to play around with in between maximal power or maximal strength and power, would you mind providing general thoughts slash key questions for me to consider below? Work to deload ratio, I'm thinking of six weeks of programming and one week of deload. I know this is pushing it. The other option would be three weeks on one week off, repeat twice. I would be grossly in favor of that second option, James. Oh yeah, that was definitely gonna say that. So the thing when you switch to higher intensity phases like maximum strength, power and stuff, you're typically, not always, but very typically your mesocyclic length will shorten to accommodate the, the intensity of the exercise. So I think what would be a better idea is just repeating a couple of those phases and keeping it like three to ones. And that would be way better than trying to do like a six to one. Yeah. Exercise selection. I plan to work out four days a week focused on four key movements. Day one, speed squat, quad focus. Day two, sprint, hamstring focus. Day three, hex bar, jump, quad hamstring. Day four, jump day, build elastic volume. I debated including this because I recognize this is taxing on the body, but at some point you need to actually jump. That's day four, I think. Um, I'll try to put a day or two between this and my next workout so I can be fully recovered. And then it says we'll work the body, other body parts at MV levels. Any thoughts on how to structure the week to ensure recovery slash maximum strength power training? Let me just go back to the, 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 the days one through four here real quick. So this is not a bad idea. Um, I would still like to see a maximal strength type day in there because that's going to transfer really, really well into jumping performance. So I think you could probably swap out that speed squat and just do like a, you know, squats for like triples or something like that. Yeah. Um, maybe, and you might have to reorder this, this, you, you might have to reorder it a little bit if you're going to. So here's kind of the deal, right? So if you have a couple max strength phases, you can just swap out day one with a high bar squat as like your maximum strength. The thing is like once you start switching into like days where you're overlapping a little bit of maximal strength stuff with a little bit of power stuff, then you might want to reorder it a little bit so that you have like a really fresh power day and that might be like one where you do the hex bar jump on day one and then maybe have the sprint day and then later in the week you do that maximal strength it's not that the maximal strength isn't important but you're making a shift in the priorities where you say like that was important before as for face potentiation purposes but now i'm actually starting to rehearse the activity in question which is the jumping um and so then you might do a quick exercise or a shift there but other than that those look pretty good for to me yeah and like sometimes you can do like um there's a name for it. Fuck. 
uh, there's actually a name for it where it's basically like they, they have a couple specific jumps that are like sports specific jumps. There's one for volleyball, which is the one where it's like the jump, the, the run and jump you would do to spike the ball. There's a name for it. I can't think of it. Uh, same thing for basketball. Like, uh, like you would do a, a jumping drill. That's like um, you charge the lane and jump towards the net. Like as if you were going to, you know, charge and dunk kind of thing. Um, those are things you could also start including as you get closer and closer and closer to dunk day. And who knows, maybe you'll actually dunk ahead of schedule. That would be pretty fun. Yeah. Progressive overload volume. I plan to keep it fairly simple. Start at three sets plus one set per week based on how perhaps soreness or speed deprecation. So uh, I would argue against that. Don't add volume in an intensity phase. Just increase the intensity. Make sure you're at your MEV to MRV, which is a very wide window for uh, these things, and you should be fine. Just make sure you're increasing intensity, not volume. Yeah, you only are going to really drive the volume up when you're in those like strength endurance type phases. And then once that's over, you're probably going to take what would be like a Tuesday on your strength endurance day, chop the volume like per week in half, and then it's probably going to stay pretty stable or if anything, maybe even go down from that point yeah. on. Intensity slash force, this is where I can do some really direct guidance. Sprint will key intensity will keep intensity low and increase intensity slowly to preserve my old man hammies. But if you're sprinting for the first time in a while, I would say really start in a half sprint for the first multiple weeks and work up to a full sprint. Because uh, yes, definitely. Really and then also don't um uh, don't uh, don't stop abruptly. One of the things I usually would have my rugby guys do when they were not used to sprinting is we would do like technique work and kind of build up. And then once they started hitting a couple full hard sprints every now and again, we'd have them stride it out. We call it stride it out where you don't, you don't hit the brakes because that's another really easy way to accidentally injure yourself on sprint training. It was where you try to, you, you hit like you do a 10 meter sprint and your instinct is to stop very fast after you cross your 10 meter mark, just stride it out very easily and kind of walk it out. Um, and also don't progress much on the sprints. The sprint is just kind of another, uh, I don't I have a hard time describing what this deal with sprints is. It's just another way of improving your ability to interact with the, the world. And in this case for basketball, for trying to dunk, it's a good way to train like driving the lane and making that jump eventually. But the emphasis shouldn't be on the sprint training in terms of like how much sprint training you're doing compared to how much like jump training you're doing. So the sprints is something you might hit like two or three sprints per week once you've built up to like being able to sprint hard. And that's it. Like then you just call it a day on that. You know, and then you just do it a little bit harder each time. Uh, speed squat and hex bar jump so this is an in-between phase between maximal strength high force low velocity and power low force high velocity on a weekly basis should i increase or decrease the weight i use week one 50 percent week two 25 week three is 30 or vice versa week three 30 percent week two 25 week three, 15 should i cap max intensity at 30 percent or since this is a transition phase, strength power, is it okay to do lift at 40 to 60? I would actually pick just e e the strength power phase is one that usually trains both uh, and doesn't mix them a ton in the same exercise, but I may be incorrect, James. No, you're right. So the, the strength power phase is kind of like you have an extended portion of your annual plan where you are starting to transition into some power stuff, but you're not committing fully to power just yet. You're still carrying over some of that stuff. So you're still going to train them independently. So you, this is why I made that, that maximum strength recommendation. So what I would do is swap out the speed squats, uh, just do squats for like, you know, three by three kind of thing, um, increase the weight on that. And then um, start very, very low on things like the hex bar jump. And what I would actually do is like a double knee bend counter movement hex bar jump and just use very, very light loads. Like you might start basically unloaded and then add like maybe two, uh, five pounds per week on that. So you would start, start basically standing up, holding the, the hex bar, and then you would do like a counter movement jump from that point on. Uh, so you would have to start with very, very light loads. You're not going to be doing like 60% or 40% of what you could hex bar deadlift. That would be a big mistake. Don't do that. Um, something like that. Yes. Did I answer the question or did I just read Yeah. It? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think in the, it, when you have that extended time in between, it's good to keep that maximal strength stuff in there because acutely that acutely ended in like a very moderate term length. So we're talking about like weeks to maybe like six months, that maximum strength work is going to have really, really big payouts on power output. Um, so it's definitely a good thing to keep in there. And so I would just maybe take those speed squats out because you already have 
um, three other power activities going on that week in which you can train pretty hard. So yeah, hopefully your dunk training comes along very nicely, my friend. Yeah. All right. Time for the YouTube. YouTube. It's a tube and it's made of you. Let me share. And we are sharing. All right. Not to make sure, make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, let's take a look at what I'm being <laughs> algorithmed. Dave Rubin, excellent. Oh, Dana see, White yeah. says stuff to John Jones. Oh, Pavel Tatsalin on the Soviet weightlifting system. Chad Wesley Smith had an excellent uh, comment on that, which is <laughs> Pavel Tatsalin has never been associated with her work with Soviet weightlifters. So I was just talking on mass. Uh, we'd FTS. Ooh, men's health. Kevin Hart. <laughs> what I eat to get shredded. Grocery haul <coughs> by Jeff Nippert. Haul. <coughs> Here I thought it was a shopping list. It's a haul when you go to like Costco for sure. Five best shoulder exercises you're not doing. Athlean X knows what you're you have, not doing. You have so much Athlean X on your thing. Who is this guy? Yeah, it's like Jeff Cavalier. And, uh, he knows things, apparently. Patient with uh, coronavirus speaks out. I like that one. Great. Speaks out about what? Fuck, for the love of God. I have the flu, bitch. <laughs> All right. Milo Wolf will start us off for today. And he says, after making some jokes about being our bitch, which he most certainly is, uh, Milo Wolf is worth a follow, guys, by the way, on Instagram. Uh, Wolf Coach on Instagram and Milo Wolf on YouTube. I don't know what the fuck he does on YouTube. Because, uh, but anyway, check that out. Uh, he's a super knowledgeable guy from England, I think. He goes, on a more serious note, what's up with the overhead triceps barbell extension you recommend? I can't quite figure out whether it would be a good exercise. In essence, they're behind the neck press with partial shoulder flexion. Rom, no. they increase the moment arm for your elbows. Increasing the likelihood of them would be limited by your triceps rather than your shoulders. That's actually great. The target is the triceps, so that's a good thing. Thus, it essentially becomes a triceps isolation move. That's it's actually, actually its intent. As the front delts aren't near failure, correct, but one that also fatigues the front delts for seemingly no good reason without stimulating them with very much, uh, as opposed to a simple tricep overhead extension in which the shoulder does not move around. Um... Yeah. So the issue here is it's actually super simple. Both myself and if you've seen Jared Feather do these, uh, we are too jacked to do them properly. So the demonstration, I don't ever do the demos. Oh, that's why he's okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Cause I was like, yeah. why are you talking about behind the neck press? Yeah. The ones I've done, I'm just like, my arms are so big. I can't fucking do them. And Jared's getting now, close to that. That makes so, more sense. Yeah, you're supposed to like reach back and get super deep, but we can't reach back anymore because the shoulder is too big. That's it. The end of the rest of this question is long head, blah, blah, blah. It's all completely correct. So you're supposed to do them properly by uh, keeping your elbows in as much as you can and reaching really far back and touching the back of your neck. You know what, Mike? So I've actually been experimenting with another movement uh, that I, I actually like a lot now. Um, so a lot of clients have a hard time with the overhead barbell, even if it's an easy bar or barbell. Uh, it's just awkward for them. The technique is very hard, so it's hard for them to kind of get into it. And I've also noticed that a lot of clients tend to have elbow problems if you have them do something like a JM press. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I've been doing lately is I'll have people do a low incline jm press so they just put it on a low incline yep. and then just do the jm on that and it takes yep. all the pain out of the elbow and it takes the awkwardness out of the overhead tricep and it's been yep. really really easy to, to great idea in. yeah various extensions are great targeting the long head seems to be an obsession with folks for no fucking good reason because yeah it's... you train it all the time in any pulling movements for some reason the other two tricep heads just get no love i don't think people even know what they're called um what about the long head the long head dr mike the long head uh, the long head's great, sweet. You can do behind the neck extensions for that. Otherwise, just do all kinds of different extensions that fundamentally two things. One, seem to stimulate your triceps a lot. And two, don't fuck with your elbows and shoulders. And if you can do those, they're great. That's really, that's really it. You know? If I see someone doing cable pushdowns properly versus jam press versus skull pressures versus dips versus overhead extensions, I'm not like that. That's a fucking idiot. Why isn't he using this other movement? I could go for an, uh, some nice long head. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? Don't stop now, uh, Bob. That's usually the person to do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm giving a blow drop. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. Let's see. Uh, okay. Evan Polico says, is there any negatives? Yes. Are there any negatives? I'm just fucking with you, Evan. I'm just being a little bitch. 
Are there any negatives to splitting up your sets throughout the day for someone with a home gym? So we actually just, um, uh, I've addressed this topic. It will be covered in an RP Plus lecture eventually because we've got a bunch of recorded that haven't gone out yet. Um, but James and I actually have addressed this recently in a webinar. Uh, you might, I think it was in the last webinar, maybe one before. Um, you can split your shit up into two sessions per day, sometimes three, but anything three or more gets to be that you're chronically in a stimulated state and you never really get a good chance to warm up and it ends up being the quality suffers and you're just always sort of catabolic and, and uh, sympathetic for lack of a better term. And, not and you, parasympathetic. you have the constant anxiety of knowing that you have to train multiple more yeah. times. Like so do your work, relax, have distinct periods for that and have distinct periods for training. But two days are totally fine. Um, I would say two days, probably 12 sessions per week of hypertrophy training is usually the limit that I recommend. Anything above that seems to have not worked for myself or folks that I've tried to get. And, and, you know, I don't want to come at this like, like being overly hostile, but I would also say like, if you're- Shut up, Evan. <laughs> no, but like, it's like, if you're entertaining the idea of doing three sessions a day, because like in your mind, for some reason that you can't commit to doing um, like a, a hard training session, like, I, I don't know. It just seems like you, your priorities are screwed up. Like you're not, you're not making up for anything by like going back and forth, kind of piddling around all day. I, I think the best results are going to be like when you come in and do a really- focused, hard training session, even if it takes a little while, maybe two at the, on the top end. And like after that, it's like, if you're trying to just do like a bunch of little piddly sessions throughout the day, I think you're, you're, you're more distracted than you are like really getting after the training. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I feel yeah. like it's, it's, there's something you're, you're not focused. You're, you have other things, you have other priorities and that might be fine. Like if you have jobs, school, whatever, that's fine. But then I, I would say, if you're entertaining that thought, just maybe readjust your priorities and say like, Oh, you know what? I, I just, I can't do a certain thing. I'm going to do my best four days a week to get into the gym and do a really good job then. And then the rest of the time I'm going to allocate towards my other responsibilities. Yeah. I'm going to turn my inner James up and attack this next question. Asker, oh but no. All good fun. And in super uh, Samuel Turner, um, Sam, I you know exactly where you're coming from. So I'm going to say something snarky. I don't really need it, but there's something to take away from it. So the question is, Brett Contreras recommends normal folks to stay around 10% of the weight they want to stay at and recomp instead of bulk slash cup. Since we can't be in a surplus, which is the most important, uh, I think this sort of the unemployed there is an important thing to muscle growth nutritionally. What else can we do to optimize results? Extra sleep, nutrient timing, more no, carbs slash protein, no, more protein feedings, no. less training volume, more slash less training volume, more frequent training, program for slower progression in the gym, progress of load in, uh, instead of increasing sets, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, like listen, all that. And is, this all a hack? is this a hack question? So, we so, right. So here's the thing, man. Uh, Sam, and this is the snarky part. I don't, I don't fucking mean any snarkiness by that. I just mean that in the literal sense, that this is a much better question for Brett Contreras because Brett Contreras is the one that recommends this. So then he is the person to ask as to how to make this a viable thing. Now, our, James and I would get off this train before we got on it. We would say, why the fuck would you do that? Bulking is a great idea. Bulking cutting slowly is great. Not bulking cutting at all means you're taking away your two best weapons of muscle gain and fat loss at the same time. So we would say that that's not a great idea. And then next question sort of on a philosophical level, it's like, well, what can we do to obviate that? Well, anything you can do to obviate that is something that someone with bulking and cutting can do also and still get ahead of you. Like the you in the universe that does bulking and cutting is just going to be better than the you in the universe that doesn't if he applies all the same strategies. So yes, do your best. Get lots of sleep, get great nutrient time, and get lots of carbs and protein. Make sure you get enough protein feedings. Use the appropriate training volume. Use the appropriate frequency of survival. Make sure you periodize that. Program for a, a good progression in the gym that's slow enough to accommodate you. And of course, balancing load and set progression is always key. Like those are all just, it's, it's kind of saying like, okay, like um, I'm getting fuel in my race car with shitty quality fuel. What should I do to optimize my race car performance? You just drive the fuck out of that car as well as you can. And you're but it doesn't go as fast anymore. Like do your best at going slower. You know, like you just, there's, yeah, there's no way to make up for that fundamental lack of anabolic stimulus. Yes. There's no way to do it. So like the people get really caught up on this recomping shit and it's, it's really frustrating. And it's, I'm not frustrated at people who have questions. I am frustrated at people who are like putting out the idea there that you can just like recomp all the time and you're going to get very good like gains. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating because the, what you're essentially asking is like, what are the ways that I can like hack recomping, right? Like there's, can I just eat more protein and that makes recomping work more? And it's like, no, if that was the case, then everyone would just do that. Then there'd be no reason to get uncomfortably lean or uncomfortably big. Like, okay. Cutting sucks. 
right? It sucks. And, um, so it's just one of these things. And I, I'm, I'm frustrated because not, I don't want to say like I'm frustrated at Brett, but like when people make recommendations like that, it kind of puts this like false narrative into a lot of people's minds that they can just recomp. And it's like, yeah, when you're a newbie, you can do that. There's no hacking in doing that. The only way that you can really get a lot of like hack, quote unquote, from recomping is when you really start using things like anabolic agents. And even then, it's not really hacking because you pay prices in other parts of your life. So it's just one of those things like there's no situation in which you can just recomp your way into having a great physique. It just doesn't happen. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Ultimately, you're going to spend a lot of time cutting and masking to a point in which you're happy and then you can stop. Christopher X, which is a sweet name. It is a sweet he's name. like a like a like a black Muslim leader, except he looks a lot like a bulldog. I was gonna say, I think he's more of a bulldog. <laughs> Bulldogs are on YouTube now. Oh. So he says, I have a question regarding injury prevention while I purchased my training from a recent video. I ran your whole male physique template 2.0, 22 weeks, and it was awesome, and I grew a lot. My muscles seemed to handle that many sets, even by week five to six. However, my joints gave me the sensation of oh. Now I know what it's like to be 97 years old. Ooh. I hope it's not genetics. It could be, and it's definitely part genetics, but we'll get to that. Could it perhaps be something as simple as not getting enough protein? Almost certainly not. No. I was thinking about buying collagen. No. Not protein amounts per se, but since the diatribe peptides, which could potentially help my joints, there's no fucking way they do that. Even if it's just placebo for me, don't do things that are, for the love of God, don't do things that are just placebo and you know what? Fuck. Don't acknowledge that it's a placebo sure. and then do it anyway, right? Right. Like, you're better than that. Um I warm up by cycling eight minutes to the gym and swinging my arms and legs and knees into the sets with lower weight and reps. Do you have any tips to increase joint health? Yes. Make sure your technique is good that during the sets, your joints don't feel compromised at all. And if one technique feels better for your joints, do that. Um, potentially make sure you're taking longer maintenance phases between these aggressive mesocycles. Maybe only do two mesocycles instead of three before taking a maintenance phase and easing off your joints. Um, and consider training with an average slightly lighter loads, potentially that'll work. And also my last one is if you know that your muscle versus joint MRV is just that far off, and sometimes it is for people, don't push your muscles as hard as they could go in any one mesocycle, especially in the later ones. Um, and uh, that will save your joints in the long term. Yeah, that was really good. I was going to say use the lighter rep ranges, like the 10 to 20 or you know, like 20, uh, 20 to 30 or 5 to 30, however you want to say that. Um, but then also you might consider splitting up more of your, your per session muscle, uh, your muscle per, ah, volume per session across a little bit more of a variety of movements, including more single joint, like uh, isolation type movements. Not to say that that's going to really uh, make it better, but it's, you just won't take the same pounding as if you were just doing nothing but bench presses and squats and rows. So it might be good to incl include some like knee extensions to make up some of that quad volume. It might be good to include some like, reverse, you know, pec deck flies for your back, stuff like that. It's not the best in terms of raw uh, stimulus, but it might be good for your joints in the long term to have a little bit more isolation work in there instead of all compounds. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's just one of those things like sometimes you can do within mesocycle things and you'll know right then and there. Sometimes it takes a few mesos, blocks or macros for you to be like, you know, my muscles can survive this. My joints can't. So I got to back off. Totally. All right. I think we're going to wrap this one up for... That's it. Okay. I'm going to be in Philadelphia this weekend. <sighs> I'm going to sell my house. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Great. Can't wait. I'll um, be shooting you, James, out of love. Let's see. Is there anything going on next week? Or are we going to... Well, we're not... Uh, yeah. Next week's good, man. Next week's good. So, yeah, we'll be back next time. If you guys enjoyed our ridiculous banter and any of the stuff you see on RP, make sure you subscribe to the RP YouTube. And we'll hey, see. James, real quick. Oh. Actually, I'll... Um, I'll ask you after we get off. Okay. It's probably get inappropriate. Off. We only ever talk after we get off. So that's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to sign off for this one, folks. Thanks for your great questions and we'll talk to you next time. Peace.